הרדיו הבינתחומי בשידורים חיים ורעיונות מיוחדים. מהכנס השנתי של ICT, המכון למדיניות נגד טרור. היי, you are on uh, IDC International Radio 106.2 FM, you are with uh, Dr. עמיחי מגן, uh, senior researcher at the ICT and the head of the governance and political violence uh, program. We are entering the final day of the 14th annual international conference of the International Institute for Counterterrorism. This is, of course, a very uh, special and momentous day because we're also commemorating the 30th anniversary of the day that changed the world, September the 11th, 2001. And we do want to speak about a changed world, uh, perhaps a fundamentally uh, changed world. To do that, uh, we're joined by a, a panel of, of distinguished uh, experts. Uh, I'll introduce them in a moment. Let me just uh, frame the issues that we want to discuss this morning. Um, if we, certainly if we look back to, to that fateful day, um, September the 11th, 2001, but then we fast forward a couple of years to the invasion of, of Iraq in 2003, and certainly even the last uh, four years, we're coming up uh, to the fourth anniversary of the, the, the launch of the so-called uh, Arab Spring. It seems that we're living in a very, very uh, different um, Middle East, uh, North Africa. Uh, we see great uh, instability. We see great uh, fluidity and uncertainty. Uh, if uh, four years ago we were hoping for rapid processes of liberalization and democratization, we have not seen that, and, and neither have we seen the replacement of old forms of stable authoritarianism with new forms of stable authoritarianism. Rather, we see this kind of cascade of state failure. We see the proliferation of areas of, of limited statehood. Uh, we see uh, power vacuums being created in Syria and Iraq and Libya uh, and, and elsewhere. And the emergence uh, of these new forms of governance, the emergence of these new forms of non-state armed groups that are vying for power uh, with increasingly weak uh, uh, state, uh, state authority. So it looks as if we're at this uh, very interesting moment in, in, in the, the history of the international system where there's genuine governance contestation between states, uh, modern sovereign uh, states based on the Sykes-Picot uh, uh, arrangements on the one hand, and these new systemic challenges such as ISIS, and Jabhat al-Nusra, uh, Boko, Boko Haram, uh, al-Shabaab, we might also include Hezbollah or Hamas in this, in this list, who are really have a very different conception of the way that the world should be organized. They have a very different conception of legitimacy, of, of human good, of human society. And we want to, uh, this morning, with the aid of our, of our experts, try to get a grip on, on, on some of these issues and try to understand them uh, a, little, a little bit better. How do we conceptualize this reality? From a, a, a military, diplomatic, and e economic point of view, how do, we, uh, how do we understand it? What kinds of new alliances, what kinds of new institutions and processes need to take place in order to try to stabilize North Africa and the Middle East in, in the face of this, these new systemic uh, uh, challenges and these new, the, the, and these new actors? So those, are, so those are the themes uh, that we are trying to, to, to grapple with, understanding that, that terrorism is fundamentally political, that the adversaries that we're facing, whether it's the Islamic State or Hezbollah or Hamas, are fundamentally political actors with a political vision. Uh, and so we're trying to get at, at, the, at the root uh, causes and dynamics of these, of these uh, processes. To do that, um, we have three uh, distinguished uh, experts in the, in, in the room. We may also be joined by uh, a fourth one on the, on the phone. Let me introduce them very, very briefly. They're all very distinguished with long careers, um, but we won't be able to get into every aspect of their CVs. Um, joining us this morning, uh, first and foremost, is Lieutenant Colonel John uh, Kinkel. Uh, good morning, John. Welcome. Good morning. Uh, John is currently the uh, U.S. Army War College Fellow at the, at the ICT. Uh, prior to this assignment, he served as the Chief of the Office of Security Corporation at the U.S. Embassy in Tunisia. 
He has a long distinguished career in the U.S. Army, he enlisted in 1992 and received a commission as a second lieutenant in military intelligence in 1994 and became a foreign uh, areas officer uh, specializing in the Middle East and North Africa in 2003. So very rich, varied uh, operational experience, uh, not only in North Africa and the Middle East, but, but uh, extensive experience there. We're also joined by Dr. David Garstensen uh, Ross. Good morning, David. Good morning. Uh, David is a senior fellow at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies and an adjunct assistant professor in, at Georgetown University's Security Studies uh, program. Uh, he focuses his research uh, on the challenges posed by violent non-state actors. And David, you and I have recently published a piece in the Washington Post about the jihadist governance dilemma. Perhaps we can touch on that a little bit. Um, last but not least, here in the studio, Aaron uh, Zellin. Uh, good morning, Aaron. Good morning. Um, Aaron is uh, the Richard Borough uh, Fellow at the Washington Institute, uh, where his research focuses on how jihadist groups are adjusting to the new political environment uh, in the era of the Arab uprisings. He also looks at Salafi uh, politics in countries transitioning uh, to democracy, we, we hope. I took this from your <laughs> online, online bio. Uh, he's also a fellow uh, at the International Center for the Study of Radicalization and Political Violence in London, and he's undertaking his PhD uh, at King's College uh, London. So, gentlemen, uh, good morning. Uh, let me uh, open up by asking you, and anyone who would like to can weigh in on this. You know, we say that we live in the midst of this profound uh, political and security transformation in North Africa and the Middle East. But what do, what do we really mean by that? How, how is our uh, geopolitical and security environment, how has it really been changed uh, over the last the last several years? And we can, again, go back, if you like, to December 2010, the, the beginnings of the uprisings in, in Tunisia, or we can look a little bit further back and maybe look at the American invasion into Iraq in 2003 uh, as a um, uh, sort of a trans transformative, a trigger uh, event that has led to this uh, cascade of, of, of change. Uh, John, would you like to weigh in on that? Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Amachai. Um, I guess where I would start is where I left in, in North Africa. And I think uh, fundamentally, there really is no change over the past 500, 1500 years, quite honestly. You have kind of a developed coast and a somewhat wild contested interior until you get to the sub-Saharan African and West, West African uh, and Arab uh, uh, empires. Uh, what, what is changing is where that line divides, uh, where, that, where, where the contested area divides. And obviously with the fall of Libya, um, the fall of the Gaddafi regime and the ensuing uncertainty there, uh, that was kind of a set, setback. I'll tell you that on the bookends of, of North Africa, in the West, uh, Morocco and Algeria, Virtually no change. The Arab Spring has brought about some political concessions, uh, but but generally s still stable democracy or st still stable institutions there. Uh, on the east, in Egypt, probably uh, uh, important to more important to, to Israel. Kind of the ver verdict is still out. Um, we don't know wh whether the stability and or democracy will prevail there. <coughs> the two big big changes in North Africa are are in the center. Uh, it's easy to focus on Libya, the, the um, predominance of, prevalence of, of uh, Gaddafi's weapons, open up bazaars, repressed tribal dynamics, historic trade smuggling routes throughout uh, that, that go through Libya into Mali and, and the rest of the Sahel um, have actually led to the or contributed to the weak and uh, unstable government there. And whether Libya stays as a unified country is, is still unseen. And However, of course, Syria and Iraq. Yes, yes, um, a, 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 as well too, yeah. for, for, sure, for sure, outside that, that immediate region. But the one bright light, quite honestly, is Tunisia where I just left. And uh, I, I could mon monopolize all the time on this, but uh, uh, I think uh, Im important uh, and of note to, to the population here is, you know, Tunisia has a, has a very uh, prosperous Jewish community. It's uh, one of the oldest continually serving Jewish communities there on Jerba Island. Um, I got to go to the Lag Bomar uh, pilgrimage uh, last May, has one of the oldest scrolls in the world. Um, and there, the women are really driving the dem democratic force there. It's a very positive sign. And if it weren't for the open weapons bazaar in Libya right next door, I'd have very, very uh, unqualified uh, optimism for Tunisia. But as it stands, 
they're really grappling with their security in a democratic fashion, which is a positive sign. Right. I mean, I think in a way, Tunisia has certainly been the sort of silver lining in an otherwise rather disappointing um, uh, regional regional dynamic. Certainly, we have not seen the kind of rapid democratization that many people have hoped uh, for. Aaron Zelen, I know that you've spent some time in, in, in Tunisia, that you're uh, carrying out work there. On mm-hmm. uh, do, do, do you share this, um, John's uh, assessment? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot will depend on... Um, what happens in the upcoming elections in the next couple of months and uh, whether it's a peaceful transfer of power and whether there's no violence during the election because that could potentially disturb things. The Constituent Assembly actually just passed four new uh, laws related to counterterrorism, I believe it was yesterday or two days ago. So they are doing it within the democratic context. Um, Unfortunately, uh, it's one of the only bright spots in the region, Um, though at the same time, one of the underlying reasons why we saw these uprisings was sort of the failure of the structures of these governments over the last 20 to 40 years, depending on the country, and many of these economic challenges still remain even in Tunisia. David, do you want to weigh in on that, on this, on, on the regional dynamic? How 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 is our geopolitical space in in North Africa and the Middle East? Perhaps we can uh, focus more on on now also on, on what's happening in Iraq and Syria. How is that um, different? Is it different um, from the situation that we saw, uh, let's say, on the eve of the Arab Spring in December two thousand? Yes, I think it's fundamentally different, and and um, yeah, I agree that. If you look at historical patterns, there's a lot of historical patterns that are the same. Um, you know, in fact, if you look at one of the dynamics we're talking about, which is violent non-state actors, uh, the 20th century really was an interanium where the Westphalian state was so dominant that we come to think of that as the way the world is naturally ordered. But if you go back even to uh, the 19th century, uh, a lot of the predominant actors in world affairs and the predominant conflicts involved violent non-state actors. Um, So I think a a few different trends uh, are all aligning, uh, all of which have the effect of weakening the nation state. Uh, One of them is uh, scarcity. Uh, Food prices are higher. uh, Oil prices are higher. Uh, It's harder for a state to govern in in multiple ways. Water is increasingly scarce as populations rise. There's much more unemployment, uh, particularly in a lot of countries uh, that are are at risk. And even Tunisia, which uh, I think all of us have a a bit of a more optimistic take about, uh, you have enormous youth unemployment. That's acknowledged to be one of the major problems within Tunisia. Uh, So you, you have that. You have advances in technology, which sometimes helps the nation state sometimes helps non-state actors. Um, it's a somewhat of a complex phenomenon, but overall uh, you have non-state actors that are able to compete with nation states the way they couldn't say 20 or 30 years ago. Um, then you have uh, increases in communication technology, which allow vibrant transnational movements uh, like the transnational jihadist movement. So looking at the region, um, I, I think that the, the tumult, tumult is only going to increase. Uh, when the Arab Spring began, you had this tremendous wave of optimism that this was going to solve jihadism and that you know, people thought that there was an inevitable march to democracy. Uh, with the Egyptian coup, regardless of what one thinks about the coup, it makes clear that there's not an inevitable march towards democracy. It could be reversible in multiple ways, uh, whether it's through the excesses of the Muslim Brotherhood or through the uh, fact that the military executed that coup. Um, Secondly, uh, Iraq and Syria is obviously, when it comes to jihadism, the most important thing that's occurring right now. And it will mean uh, much more to this generation of jihadists even than Afghanistan did in the 1980s. You have more foreign fighters who've gone there. Uh, You already have a tremendous transnational jihadist presence, which didn't exist. Uh, until the end of the Afghan-Soviet war. Uh, so th- this, and the final thing I'll say is that there was a perception, I, th- I think, um, at the beginning of the Arab Spring that the wave of instability would play in favor of the United States' Western democracies and that it would work out well. And I think that, that that's something which really needs to be called into question. Uh, obviously, Libya is not looking too, well, too good. Uh, Syria and, and Iraq, we've already talked about. Um, but it, it seems that, that, that these waves of instability is at, have, have actually overwhelmed the ability of states to adapt and uh, deal with it and have a smooth transition to democracy. Right. So we see a reduced state ability to maintain a monopoly on the 
use of legitimate violence. We see a reduced state capacity to provide essential public goods to the population, which I agree with you is a long-term trend. This is a, not a new thing. At the, exactly at the time when the population is expecting and demanding more than it probably did uh, in the past, we see a reduced state capacity to control borders, uh, which means increased fluidity and movement of fighters and weapons. And there is a regional uh, effect. There is There's a diffusion. There is an inf uh, infection uh, effect. There is uh, centers of chaos uh, produce negative externalities, which then affect neighboring uh, areas. We in Israel, of course, are very concerned about stability in Jordan, given that Jordan is, is, is increasingly uh, surrounded by chaos. But I want to turn to the, the issue, another issue that you raised, uh, David, which is the rise of these competing uh, non-state actors. And your comment that we in the 20th century have become used to the idea that the world is organized into <clears throat> these neat uh, political units called sovereign nation states with clear borders and boundaries, and that states have an exclusivity um, in the international system. It's actually a very new idea. Uh, in many respects, it's, a, it's fiction. It's always been a fiction. Stephen Krasner has famously written a book called uh, uh, sovereignty is organized hypocrisy. Um, states having a stake in maintaining this illusion that the world is composed in this way. This historically has not been the case, and maybe we are leaving that uh, historical moment where we can maintain that, that illusion and we will have to contend with a much more uh, diverse set of political and security actors, including the rise of what I'm increasingly calling non-state armed governors who are getting into the governance uh, game. To discuss uh, that phenomena, uh, we want uh, to uh, bring up on the phone Dr. Benedetta Berti, uh, who, who really is an expert on, on these issues, on, on, on non-state armed groups. Uh, Benedetta is a research fellow at the Institute for National Security Studies, a young uh, Atlanticist at the Atlantic Council, and a member of the faculty uh, at Tel Aviv University. Benedetta's research is related to political violence and conflict in the Middle East. She focuses especially on the political conduct of armed groups, notably Hezbollah and Hamas. Good morning, uh, Benedetta. Good morning. Can you hear me? Very good. Uh, yes. Benedetta, we want to understand the phenomena of the rise of these non-state armed groups. Some might call them non-state armed governors, or at least uh, groups that are increasingly getting into the, into the governance uh, game. You have done a lot of work uh, on these groups, especially on, on Hezbollah and, and Hamas. How should we understand these actors as, as political actors? How are, they, how are they different from states and how are they different from, let's say, criminal, criminal gangs? Right. Well, uh, I'll start with the criminal gangs because I think th there is a very uh, distinctive uh, different purpose to this organization. So whereas groups like Hamas or Hezbollah have been involved in illicit activities as a fundraising source, however, that's not really their main goal. Their main goal is very much political and is very much aimed at uh, changing the political system where they operate. So they're not profit-driven like normal uh, criminal organization at the same time. Time, and where I'm getting at is these groups are becoming extremely hybrid. At the same time, these groups also do engage in illicit activities. Now, when we talk about how are they different from states, and that it becomes even more, more, more interesting because if you take, for example, a group like Hezbollah, they've had a remarkable transformation in the past 20 years, basically evolving from a marginal um, militia that was not involved in the political system. They have evolved now into a mainstream political party, at the same time into the biggest social service provider in Lebanon, at the same time into a very profitable uh, corporation that engages engages in both licit and illicit activities. And at the same time, they also evolved militarily from being, again, a non-conventional militia into being this hybrid army that is able to wage simultaneously conventional and non-conventional Warfare. So it's, it's so, really this notion of hybridity that yeah. is so fascinating, mm -hmm. uh, both hybridity in the, in the sense that economic activity, governance activity actually helps these groups become more entrenched in society, but also gather more assets and more resources to be able to carry out uh, their uh, violent uh, agendas uh, to, to, to fund terrorism and insurgency and, and, and so on and so forth. 
Um, uh, is this economic, and, uh, and I want to open this up to, to the panel, is this involvement in governance and economic activity a pure gain for these organizations, or does it also impose costs and constraints upon them that we need to, that we need to understand? Uh, David, do you want to relate to that? It, it's clear that there are costs to it. Um, as, you know, it depends a, a bit upon the kind I of I guess what I'm trying to get at, sorry, David, is are these groups more dangerous as a result of their growing hybridity or um, will power moderate them? Will the fact that they acquire assets that perhaps they're uh, reluctant to lose uh, help us to to uh, establish deterrence vis-a-vis -vis these groups? It depends entirely on the kind of group. Um, the, the answer, I think, is, is yes for some and no for others. Uh, I mean, Amachai, you mentioned before the piece that you and I put together for the Washington Post on this issue, and uh, it, it looks specifically at Salafi jihadist groups and their efforts at governance. I think that that unambiguously makes them more dangerous as organizations. I mean, there's also weakness embedded in it, which I'll get to in a second, but it makes them more dangerous in that when you control territory, um, it can uh, sometimes provide a sustainable source of revenue. We can see uh, with, the, with, with ISIS in Iraq and Syria, um, their attempts to get sustainable revenue from uh, sale of oil on the black market, uh, from hostage taking, from imposing taxes on populations. Um, it also provides them ability to, uh, and, and space, to plan future military operations, which makes them uh, a more dangerous military force. The flip side is that there, for Salafi jihadist groups in particular, uh, there's weaknesses embedded within this. Uh, their ideological rigidity tends to show up when they try to govern. Uh, the sheer brutality with, with which they try to govern ultimately, uh, in every case, has ended up alienating populations, even when they've been effective service providers. Uh, it's organizations, I think, that are, are a little bit more flexible, um, that where, where, number one, they could be uh, more dangerous in the sense that they can use uh, governance as a pure good, and there's less of the downside for them. But secondly, conversely, there's more of a chance that they can moderate through the experience of having to govern if they're more flexible. Well, unfortunately, we're, we're uh, coming to the end of our time. As you can see, we've only scratched uh, uh, the surface. We have about five minutes uh, uh, remaining, and I want to uh, give each of you an opportunity to perhaps comment on uh, the NATO, the the NATO NATO Cardiff uh, uh, summit, which has just been concluded, and this emerging uh, coalition, what uh, President Obama has called the coalition to de degrade and and destroy uh, ISIS, um, given 